Um, so I'm going to be talking about solubility today. Um, this is going to be in a little bit different format. Uh, normally I'm using slides or I'm using slides and uh, aiding my situation with the whiteboard. Uh, this time we're just going to be using a whiteboard, as you can see here, uh, going over those seven topics. Um, the last two, organic solubility and biomolecular application, are kind of uh, kind of novel, so they're not going to be the main focus of the stream. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about what solubility is, defining spontaneity, uh, potential energy and entropy, environmental changes and how that affects solubility, and solubility curves. So we're going to go formal first, just because uh, it's better to start that way, in my opinion. Um, so solubility is the spontaneity of this process. You have a salt composed of a positive X ion and a negative Y ion decomposing in the presence of some solvent into its respective ions. So typically this solvent is water. Um, and typical salts, you see like table salt, which is sodium chloride, which is NaCl. Um, so it's really, that's really what all solubility is. Like there's a, and there's a limit to solubility called uh, a solution being saturated. We call it a solution that's reached its limit saturated. For example, if you pour just normal sugar in water um, and you spin it around and there's not a lot of sugar in there, all the sugar is gonna dissolve. You're not gonna see any sugar anymore. Right, it'll still you'll still taste the sugar. The sugar will still be in there, but there's not going to be any physical solid sugar in there anymore. But if you pour a lot of sugar in the water and try and stir it up, there's going to be a point where the water can't dissolve the the sugar anymore. And other substances, like let's say you put a rock inside water and you try to you try to swirl it around, rock isn't really necessarily chemical, so it doesn't apply this way. But it's just an analogy. Uh, you try to put a rock in water, you spin it around and the rock doesn't dissolve. Uh, you may get some dirt off of the, of the rock, but obviously that rock is less sol soluble than something like sugar is, solid sugar, because it dissolves less. Some rocks may dissolve very well. I have never seen that <laughs> personally, but I'm, I'm sure it's out there somewhere, a really soluble natural rock. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what solubility is. Um, a lot of the times this can be a solid dissolving or it could actually be a gas as well. Um, a gas dissolving in water is kind of a weird thing to think about, but the, the gas can essentially, when put in the, in the, in the solution, it could split up into its ions, like a, like H2 gas. I don't know if H2 gas is very soluble in water. It's probably soluble in something. I'd imagine a basic H2 is very soluble in a very basic solution, like potassium hydroxide. Um, but it can split up into its H plus ions because H2 is two H pluses bonded together by a covalent bond. So, yeah, I mean that's that's really all solubility is. It's you put a substance in water and does it dissolve? Yeah or no? Uh, and it all depends on a. Uh, it all depends on the on the polarity of the molecule. So when we're talking about something that's or not necessarily molecule because NaCl necessarily isn't actually a molecule. It's a. It's a. It's an ionic. Uh, I'm trying to think of it. Just an ionic characterized uh, physical thing. Um, so if we think of something like water. which looks like this and has two lone pairs centered around this. There is a uh, dipole moment. This is polar, right? There's one going up here, one going up here, and you add them together. And the uh, net dipole moment goes up through the molecule like this. These point this way because the oxygen is partial negative charge. It's hogging the electrons. And these both have a partial positive charge. So water is polar, 
that's that's a big thing. But something like, uh, what's an example of a solid you put in water that's it's not polar? Uh, I'm blanking right now, but most most solids you'll you'll uh, you'll put in water and it will be soluble. Um, here's a good one actually. Just simple methane. Or not methane because methane isn't really a solid room temperature. But we'll think of like a uh, graphene. This is organic notation. We're emitting the carbons. Every elbow is a carbon, and we're ignoring the hydrogens as well. This will come up later in the stream. So, graphene just sort of an infinite sheet of uh, these rings right here, which is kind of weird to think about. That's like an infinite sheet of rings, but it won't dissolve in water. Um, if you don't believe me, stick a pencil in water and it won't dissolve. Technically, it's graphite, but graphite is just sheets of graphene stacked on top of each other. And th this is the reason why it doesn't dissolve in water is because this is nonpolar. Nonpolar. So the basic uh, idea here is that, uh, well, I have to define these terms first. Solute is something you put in whatever substance you're working with, the thing that's supposed to be dissolving or not dissolving, and the solvent is the thing that's dissolving it. So for example, NaCl being put into water, splitting up into sodium ions plus chlorine ions. This is the solute. And then this is the solvent. A uh, quick note, this uh, solvent under the reaction arrow is very common uh, organic chemistry notation or biology notation, which is essentially organic chemistry anyways. But uh, you probably won't see it in AP. It'll typically just have this reaction right here without the H2O under the arrow and say it's being dissolved in water. But um, so we're going to be looking at why polar dissolves polar. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so if we think of, let's just go with NaCl anyways. So if we think of NaCl dissolving in water, NaCl has a partially positive er, edge and a partially negative edge or side. And if we think of it being dissolved in water, something polar, um, the interaction will look like this. We have partial negative charge attracting here, partial positive repelling, partial positive repelling. And then on this side, we have the opposite case. We have the partial negative repelling, partial positive attracting, partial positive attracting. So when you're putting something polar in a polar solvent, what happens is the polar molecules will attract each polar end of the, of the solute and rip it apart basically by the electric attraction, by opposites attract and lights repel. Uh, the partially positive, if you look on the left side with the, with, the, with the sodium, the partial positive on the oxygen is going to attract the partial negative or the partial positive on the sodium and vice versa. The partial negative on the chloride is going to be attracted to the partial positive of the hydrogen. So that's why that happens. Um, if you think of something like, uh, think of something like, let's say NaCO in methane, liquid methane, which is probably going to be a gas, but regardless, liquid methane, which looks like that, that's actually ethane. Um, so there's no reason this should be attracted to this. And if we drew it on this side too, there's no reason the Na should be attracted to that ethane. Um, there's just no reason. The, the CH bond is nonpolar. It has a very low electron activity difference. And that's, that's really all there is to it. And the opposite case is true if you put something like, like graphene in water. Um, there's 
no reason the graphene is going to be attracted to the hydrogen at all or the oxygen. There's just no, there's no hogging of electrons, so there's no charge differences in the graphene. There's charge differences in the oxygen, but that doesn't matter. For the electric force to happen, there needs to be two charges, not just one. And those, because that, that's how things attract and repel. When you think of something like opposites attract and likes repel, the graphene, there's no like or opposite. There's just no charge. So there's no repelling or attracting. So we have polar solves polar. So we've established that. Um, and with this little thought experiment here, we've established that nonpolar does not dissolve dissolve polar dissolve polar we establish that fact by this analogy we've also established that polar does not dissolve I'm going to abbreviate here and use NP for not polar. So we established three facts here. So the general trend here is like dissolves like. Something polar dissolves something polar. But what about nonpolar and nonpolar? So we need to look at spontaneity here and the effects of spontaneity. So we know that the, um, we know that, or if you've watched the previous streams, you know that uh, systems will always favor lower potential energy states. Uh, that's why if you drop something on the ground, uh, it falls because it's decreasing its potential energy with the earth and turning that potential energy into the energy of movement, kinetic energy. So when we think about spontaneity, there's also another term that we're kind of neglecting when we use that analogy, and that's entropy. And entropy is a measure of the number of states a system can have, the number of microstates. Um, for example, for a, for a coin that's heads or tails, ignoring the weird possibility it lands on its side, there's two possible states. There's not a lot of entropy, but if you think of something like a like a big room, there's a lot of entropy. You can be putting things really anywhere. I imagine there's quite literally almost infinite entropy that you can't calculate. Um, so the way entropy is defined, which is kind of irrelevant to chemistry, but it, it helps, um, is entropy, which is denoted with S, is Boltzmann's constant, which is just a constant that's also uh, in a different form of the ideal gas law, times the natural log of the number of states. I'm going to denote this with n. Um, and there's a reason that it's a it's a logarithm and not like a like a like a power or just simply kV times n. Um, when we think about two systems, system one, it has we'll say m possible microstates. System one and system two has n possible microstates. We want their entropies to add together, but when we think about the system as a combined system, due to statistics and combinatorics, the total number, total possible number of microstates is uh, their product. So, in the same analogy, if you think of a, if you think of a coin, a coin has two microstates. But if you think about two coins. Um, there's four microstates, right? So a normal coin, one coin can have either heads or tails, only two states. But two coins has H, H, which is two heads. It has a tail and a head, a head and a tail, and two tails. Think about three coins, it'll have six. It'll have six possible states. So their their numbers are adding. So when we look at the total entropy, this is going to be the total or the Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of the total number of states, which is n times m. However, due to a natural log property, we can split up that product in the natural log. You'll notice if you took a freak out. If not, then just believe me. You can split this up into 
this. And by distributing, I'm going to do that again. You'll get K or Boltzmann's constant times natural log of the first number plus Boltzmann's constant times natural log of the second number. And this is just the entropy of the first system plus the entropy of the second system. So the natural log allows for these to be additive. Now, something that should be intuitive to you is, oh, another person just joined. Uh, hi, Sonia. So you may have not just joined. I don't have the chat open because this uh, whiteboard is kind of big. So the universe always favors disorder. Uh, right, if you think of having a gas, a very concentrated gas in the corner of a room, over time that gas will become spread out. Because that gas is more spread out, there's more and more space the gas occupies, which means there's more microstates the gas can be in. So that entropy is always increasing. And when we're thinking about now a nonpolar uh, solvent, or a nonpolar solute and a nonpolar solvent, there's no attraction at all. However, what's being favored is uh, disorder. What's being favored is an increase in entropy. And the way to increase that entropy is to dissolve that solvent and split it up into its ions. So we have now established with the whole, with the entropy analogy that nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. You might wonder uh, why this doesn't mean Polar dissolves nonpolar, um, and the, the 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 real the real issue there is the system is already going through a bunch of uh, it's going through big big entropy changes with the bonds between the between the molecules and the solvent. Uh, for example, when we're talking about water, water has hydrogen bonds to itself, and when things are moving around, the hydrogen bonding is really affecting the movement of the of the water molecules, which is creating a big enough change in entropy that that uh, it won't affect the system that much if the uh, for example, the graphene in this example dissolves. So that's the spontaneity there, and that's why that affects solubility. Uh, and we're talking about environmental changes. First, we have to look at a solid. We have to look at a solid salt or a solid anything being dissolved in the presence of a solvent. So we have X plus plus y minus so what do we what is temperature defined to be right temperature is defined to be a measure or proportional to the average kinetic energy of a system and kinetic energy is energy of movement so the faster or the higher temperature something has the faster the molecules are moving um, in the system so when we have let's say x y and water draw this out fully just to be more explicit actually hold on this is not in the right spot or not in the right orientation rather we have h o h okay so we now have uh We've established what's going on in the system. When you put the salt in the water, the water molecules will attack the salt as if it's some sort of like virus, but it's attacking it because of the whole like or opposites attract phenomenon with electricity. So when we're looking at the system, when we're looking at an already hot beaker of water, an already hot solvent, the molecules are already moving super quickly. So when the temperature is higher, the molecules uh, the molecules will accelerate at the same rate, or at generally the same rate, because the the electric forces change a little bit on temperature. But that's negligible in this case. Um, it doesn't. It's not anywhere near the amount of change that happens from temperature. So when we're thinking about the salt being put in warmer water, the water has a faster or an easier ability to attack the uh, attack the salt faster. So when the temperature when the temperature increases. So does the solubility. This is not entropy. I'm going to make that a little more explicit. That's solubility. So the opposite case is true with, uh, with gases. 
So if we have this being a solid, now we have X, Y being a gas. Uh, temperature increase decreases the solubility of the gas. And the reason why that is is because the... So when we're thinking about, I, I'm going to have to explain this mathematically. I, I don't know how I can put this in words because I have the idea in my head, but it's kind of difficult. So, and if we're thinking about the speed of something as a gas, the molecular speed, the ratio uh, as a solid, the ratio between the speed of it as a gas and the speed of it as a solid, um, it's much greater, right? The it's a very it's a very large ratio. The the gas is, has a lot more entropy, has a lot more disorder. There's a lot more possible microstates it could be in. So it's moving around a lot faster to reach that full equilibrium that the system's trying to reach, but it's not necessarily full equilibrium because the entropy is always increasing. Um, so the gas is moving faster in this case than the liquid, whereas in the first case, the solid is moving slower than the gas. So the temperature increase more or less, it more so affects the speed of the gaseous, uh, the gaseous solute. So it's moving around faster in the solution at a higher temperature. So it's much harder for the water molecules to trap it and, and break it up. So that's why a temperature increase when you're dissolving a gas is uh, going to decrease the solubility of the gas, where it's the opposite case for a solid. So I'm about to do a magic trick. You guys ready? Solubility curve. So that came up out of nowhere. I'm kidding, I have, a, I have a thing bounded. So here we have a graph of a lot of different curves of a lot of different salts. We have solubility, which is grams of the salt and 100 grams of water as a function of the temperature. Um, and you do see that it's generally increasing as temperature increases, except for the cesium sulfate there, which is kind of a, a misnomer. I don't know why that's the case. Um, so not a misnomer, it's just a, it's just a weird exception. I'm not sure why, but when we have, let's say we have a temperature of 15 degrees and we have 90 grams, grams of sodium nitrate NaO3 for every 100 grams of water. Speaking of that, I've started saying water differently because of my girlfriend. I don't like it. But we have 15 degrees. There's 90 grams of sodium nitrate per 100 grams of water. Um, so if we look at where this is on the graph, we have 15 degrees, which is right here, and 90 grams. This is, this is, I want to circle the point. This is above the line. This means it's super saturated. This means that at 15 degrees, the water can only dissolve about 85 grams of the of the of the sodium nitrate. So there's about to be there's about five grams of excess solvent that the water just can't break up because it's already broken it up enough. It's broken it up as much as it can. And when you look at these solubility curves, oftentimes you'll be given a temperature and you'll be given an amount of a an amount of a solvent that's getting ready to dissolve or that they're trying to dissolve into the solvent. And it'll ask you if it's super saturated, under saturated, or saturated. And super saturated, we'll say super saturated above the curve, saturated on the curve, and under saturated below the curve. Saturated means it's at the perfect amount of uh, amount of solvent the solute can, or the amount of solute the solvent can dissolve. I get the vocab mixed up. So obviously it's never gonna be perfect. It's never gonna be 100% perfect, but when we're dealing with calculations, it can be approximated as sort of perfectly saturated. Under saturated means you can put more, uh, you can put more solvent in the, you can put more solute into the solvent and it'll dissolve. And super saturated means it's reached its limit, it's well beyond its limit. There's gonna be some excess solid in the, uh, in the solvent. So that's really, all there really is for solubility, actually, it's not really a, 
a big concept. We do see. Oh, and one one note. This is their alt liquids, right? Because if we're looking, if it were gaseous, the curves would be inverted. We'd get a decrease in solubility as temperature increases. So as you can see in the graph, for most of them, except for the cesium sulfate, which I, I just I don't know why that's the case. Um, you increase the temperature, the solvent has more of an ability to uh, dissolve this solute. So, yeah, I mean that's really it for uh, for solubility. Um, and there's no one in the stream. <laughs> kind of unfortunate. Um, if you're watching the replay, I really highly recommend you like go to these streams because these lectures aren't meant to be me just talking. Because there's no, there's very little learning involved when. I'm just talking to you and you're just listening. That's why we go in school to learn things rather than just watch videos on YouTube. Um, the conversation is better than a lecture. And it's really easy to ask questions. And like if I, if I, for example, if I say something in the stream that you don't get, that's fundamental to the rest of the ideas and you're just watching a video, you're kind of out of luck, right? Um, and that's a, that's a problem. So, yeah, I mean, that's just my little, my little tangent. If you're watching these replays, uh, come by the stream to learn because um, it's, it's way better to learn than watching the replay, in my opinion. Um, so these curves are determined experimentally. Um, it's really easy to, or it's not easy, but it's definitely, you could do a lot of light techniques to see if something is still if there's still remaining solid in a solution uh for example if you're dissolving the sodium nitrate the example we use um in the solution uh the the amount of light that the solution is going to absorb will be much greater if there's a solid in the solution right because if you think of like think of this water bottle right here there's going to be it's a lot easier for the water bottle to pass through the, or for the light to pass through this liquid water than it is to pass through this solid label. So, and there's gonna be some solid in the solution. And if I really wanted to, I could rip off this label, shove it in here, shine some light through it and show that on the wall next to me, there's going to be, uh, there's gonna be less light going through and there's gonna be a spike in that graph right here. So if you're thinking about, uh, hold on, let's check this. Okay, this definitely overlaps. Uh, if you're thinking about, like a, uh, I'm gonna move this on this tab so it goes away whenever I start talking about the biomolecular application there, which is really neat, by the way. You may be surprised what it is. <laughs> um, so we're thinking about like the absorption for like uh, for you know a, a, a solution with solid in it it would be much higher than something that had no solid in it. There'd be less light going through if there were solid in it. So it's a lot easy. It's very easy to experimentally determine whether there's even a teensy bit of solid left in the solution. And the way you just, it's kind of, I imagine it'd be a tedious process. You could just put like a grant per gram of, uh, or per five grams or something of the solvent in solute, stir it up a lot, probably with a magnetic stir because the magnetic stir is going to be stronger and not going to miss any of those extra uh, particles laying around, extra molecules laying around. Um, it's going to stir it very well, and then you can shine light through it, and you can see uh, when it reaches a certain point. And also, if there's some dissolved ions in the solution, for example, an undersaturated solution, something with more uh, with more solute in it is still going to absorb less light for the same reason. Like if you're if you put sand in water, stir it up, it's going to appear darker. Put more sand in the water it's going to stir up where you stir it up, it's going to appear darker. And then there's also going to be a point where you pour so much sand in it, it can't dissolve it anymore, which is why oceans exist because uh, if this solubility didn't happen. The solubility process didn't happen. Then we would have a problem because there wouldn't be any floors in the ocean. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about uh, organic solubility um, and another magic trick. Whoa. So this is tosyl chloride. 
Um, again, you have this ring right here where there's no labeled atoms. Um, every non-labeled elbow is a carbon. And those second lines are double bonds. And if, for example, on this carbon right here, one, two, three, there's only three bonds. Carbon makes four bonds. There's an extra hydrogen out here that we're kind of neglecting because the carbon uh, hydrogen bond, as we talked about before, is nonpolar. Uh, it's not very reactive, so we don't, we're not really interested in when we draw stuff out. So when we're looking at tosyl chloride in a reaction, uh, this is uh, this is cyclohexanol. This is uh, a hexagonal uh, structure of carbons with uh, an alcohol group, an OH, which is also a hydroxide group um, on the end of it. So that hydroxide group is on my phone. That hydroxide group is going to uh, be an alcohol. It's also going to it's just going to attach to the end of it. So when we're looking at the reaction, it makes a tosyl chloride. Um, the whole phenomenon here is that tosyl chloride becomes soluble in water. Um, the reason why it becomes soluble in water is because this bond right here is polar, the chlorine sulfur bond. So what happens is the chlorine group leaves. These electrons in the bond become attached to the, the chlorine. And the tosyl, um, it's actually this way. I believe, yes, it is. So it's actually the uh, the cyclohexanol group being attracted to the tosyl, and then the new structure you have here. I'm going to draw it out in this notation, the organic notation, just because it's a, it's a little more compact. We now have O with a hydrogen and a tosyl, and because this uh, now has an extra group bonded to it, it now has a plus one formal charge. And then what happens next is the, you have something else like a, uh, like pyridine, which looks like that. Yeah, pyridine, pyridine, which uh, what happens is the electrons in the bond and the hydrogen go to the oxygen and then you have the pyridine taking the hydrogen, and then now you're left with what looks like this. So the whole point with organic solubility here is that the tosyl chloride is going to be soluble in water. So if you conduct this reaction in water, this will happen. But if you conduct this reaction in something nonpolar like octane, which is what goes in cars, or is what part, I think it's what, what's part of gasoline. Um, or something part of gasoline, more so race cars and normal uh, normal civilian cars, or normal average day, everyday civilian cars. Um, yeah, do this in, oct or in, in octane, it's not gonna happen. Do this, in, uh, do this in water or ethanol or something polar, and this reaction will happen. So, Now we can look at the biomolecular uh, application. And it's going to be a little probably, um, if you're not mature about this, it's going to be a little weird. I know it's high schoolers, but um, the biomolecular application I'm going to be doing is the oxidation of ethanol in the liver, um, which is just the metabolization of the typical like drinking alcohol. So I right, have to get rid of this. We'll fill this in so it looks a little nicer. So the oxidation of ethanol. So we do have um, this reaction here. We have NAD plus with ethanol. And NAD plus is something that's produced in the liver. And the whole reason why solubility is the, the a main kicker here is because um, if NAD plus weren't soluble in water, then this reaction wouldn't happen. Um, for example, we have another, we have pyruvate, I think it's how it's pronounced. That's also very common in the liver. Um, and if solubility didn't happen, or solubility phenomena didn't happen, then this pyruvate, this negative charge on the pyruvate would be attracted to this NAD plus. Um, and 
for example, if we have, again, we're looking at x, y dissolves into x plus plus y minus. If this reaction is spontaneous, then it's the inverse for the other reaction. It's the inverse for x plus plus y minus forming x, y. This is not spontaneous for the same reason that the other one is spontaneous, just reversing the reaction, so you reverse the outcome. Um, so when we're looking at this reaction right here, we have uh, ethanol and NAD+. What happens here is the bonds in the between the oxygen and the hydrogen. I think, hold on, I gotta, I gotta think about this. So I'm not a biology person yet, actually, but the, yeah, so the hydrogen moves, or rather what happens is the, yeah, this is right. The electrons go to the hydrogen, which, or the electrons of the bond go to the hydrogen, which creates an ion. Um, these electrons move over to this bond, and the NAD plus comes in and swoops in and takes out that hydrogen. And then you have a double bonded, uh, this is, I think, acetaldehyde uh, plus NADH plus H plus. And the rate right here that this happens at is 4.34 times 10 to negative fifth molar per hour. So the first step of ethanol being dissolved in the liver is pretty slow. Um, and the key takeaway is that this, is, or the key takeaway for this step is that this is very toxic. Uh, this is not, <laughs> this is not good for the for you to have in your body. Uh, that's why hangovers happen, um, because this slow step right here that's occurring uh, is the is is the main step, or is the 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 step that determines how fast the reaction goes, because it's the slowest, like limiting reactants. It's the same case, um, and this toxic molecule is what makes your body react badly, like vomiting, you have a headache. Um, I hope you don't have a headache because you're a high schooler watching this. So you shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> I hope if, if, the, if, the, if the old people telling you not to drink didn't convince you, maybe this will convince you that it definitely produces a very, alcohol produces an even more toxic chemical in your body and ethanol is already toxic. So how does the body get rid of this? Um, what happens is there's more NAD plus left over from the reaction, right? Because your liver is constantly producing NAD plus and there's also water in your liver. I hope you know there's water in your liver. And what happens here is the initial step for this step, I think it may be concerted, but it might not be because the, the, the biochemistry resources aren't that good online. Um, so what happens first is the hydrogen comes over here and then the It actually looks like that, I think. Yeah. So the what happens here is you have H three C C O and there's a positive formal charge here. And then you have a water left over after the NADH snags the H. And you may think like, why does the NADH snag the H um, if it's positively charged? It's not positively charged in uh, normal physiological conditions at the body's base pH. It's actually negatively charged. Uh, I think it's really bad notation for that, but the positive charge is there because the formal charge of the molecule is a positive. Uh, it's a positive in the nitrogen, but a physiological pH is gonna be attracting more hydrogens to it, which makes it overall negative. So now we have, I'll draw it like this, water. And what, what the water does is it moves over here and then forms this compound, which is, looks like this. So this right here isn't the most stable, a positive charge isn't the most stable. So what happens is another NAD plus comes in and takes this hydrogen. And then we have this compound right here. So there's a lot of solubility or solubility makes this reaction happen because NAD plus is very reactive in this reaction. It's a very, uh, it's a very big component of the reaction. You know, if NAD plus wasn't there, this reaction wouldn't happen and you just have alcohol or ethanol deposits in your body if you drank alcohol, which uh, I'm sure you can infer is not 
too good for you. Um, it's just, just not good for you. <laughs> um, so there's another, there's some more, there's more revealing reasons here that kind of relate to, I'm sure something or something most high schoolers know. Um, this M right here is moles of solute per, or moles of solvent, no, moles of solute per liter of solvent, uh, or the other way around. So this means moles of the salt right here, which is this being dissolved in the water, liters of water. So if we're thinking about adding more, adding more water in the reaction, so, you know, drinking water after partying, um, this rate will stay constant if you increase the uh, if you increase the the denominator on that moles per liter. You also have to increase the moles, so that means the actual mass of the ethanol is dissolved quicker and quicker and quicker. And the same case goes for here. If you drink less, there's less moles being dissolved, so the rate is slower. Or it's not the rate is slower, but there's a uh, it's dissolving it faster if there's less um, because that will always stay constant. So. A lot of this you'll uh, you won't ever see like these structural mechanism diagrams and all that good stuff, um, which I wish you should because, in my opinion, AP really doesn't prepare you for organic, and it's a great way to prepare you for organic. But for this one, we have typically what you'll see when you think about these dissolution reactions or physical processes. This is more of a reaction than a physical process. You have H three C. What's next? C O H there should be an H right here. H should there. No, we'll uh we'll make it a little more obvious. C O H two plus N A D plus we have this Reducing, we now have H three C C O H plus N A D H plus N H plus. So this is typically how you'll see it if you saw like if you for some reason they put this reaction on the AP exam. This would be the first step, and then the second step would be H three C C O H plus N A D plus plus water making we now have H three C C O H H C C O O plus N A D H plus two hydrogen or hydrogen ions. So that's I'm showing you this this whole thing, and all you'd get on an IP exam would be that thing at the bottom right there. Um, and you'd be asked, like, what happens if you increase the concentration of the ethanol? What happens if you increase the concentration of the NAD plus? What happens if you increase the concentration of the water? Surprisingly, increasing the concentration of the water does nothing to the reaction. Uh, and you'll learn that in kinetics, which hopefully I'll be streaming. Um, if not, it'll be someone else, someone else great on the team. Um, so, yeah. Um, no one really joined the stream tonight, which is kind of unfortunate, but... Um, ideally, I spend 10 or so minutes answering questions afterwards, or I uh, and I spend about five or 10 minutes talking about the questions that they send in the chat while I'm lecturing. But you know, now I couldn't, so the stream's going to be a little shorter tonight. Shorter tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, if you're watching this recording afterwards, uh, I hope you learned something. Um, I, cause you can see, I don't think you can see the chat with the recording. If you, if you can't, I'll do it in here. 
this is my Instagram. Um, you can follow me or send me a DM about your homework questions for, I can also, I can answer anything about chemistry, physics, calculus, or any math. Um, and if you DM me, I'll answer you as soon as I can. And, or as soon as I see it and have the availability to answer it. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the stream. Uh, take care.